as of whenever I managed to pick this one up, I've really got to get this back on some kind of track before October, he said, knowing the best way to do that is to stop letting the fucking things run longer than 10 minutes just because you no longer have an editor forcing the issue. We will be about a week out from D23, which is basically a trade convention for all things Disney fandom that's been going on for a long time but never really got super well covered until Disney also came to mean Marvel and Star Wars, so now it's basically Comic-Con slash CinemaCon Part 2 every year, and this is the world we live in now. It also means here comes the next big wave of Marvel announcements exclusively since no one really expects any big Star Wars news since we've all accepted that the franchise is in a Baby Yoda-shaped holding pattern until someone figures out whether it's actually possible for that property to be anything other than recycling and remixing stuff from the older movies without causing an international crybaby incident again. So get ready for another round of new project drops, new titles, new casting reveals, trailers, and by now the welcome spectacle of the internet declaring it no longer cares about anything from Phase 4 onward juxtaposed with the even greater spectacle of how much they very clearly care about not caring. I mean, not to belabor the point, but look at some of these run times. Over five hours? There's only one thing I'd enjoy doing for more than five hours at a time, and uh, it ain't going up on YouTube. <laughs> 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 Anyway, now that we're supposed to at least be pretending that we're back in normal times and thus reactions to the regular flow of movie releases are no longer supposed to be accompanied by concerns about whether or not the medium itself has survived the recent troubles, unless you're a Warner Discovery shareholder, in which case, hey, good luck out there, you're gonna need it. One can also expect the discourse to swing belatedly back around to where it was pointed immediately post-Endgame but pre-COVID and the question of Marvel fatigue, i.e., is that a thing? Yeah, I mean, after more than a decade, dozens of movies and shows, tons of characters and story, a whole global culture reading defining generational touchstone of storytelling, etc., has this whole thing finally managed to overstay some or even a lot of its welcome, with fans, the general public, with critics, and the entertainment press within its own genre, even the industry itself? It's quite a question, one that requires careful consideration. Yes! Fucking yet. How? What kind of stupid question is that? Of course, 15 years is a long fucking time. Time is a thing. Yes, people get tired of stuff. Of course, Fatigue for Marvel, for any kind of long-running thing, is a thing. Time exists. It's not an issue of whether or not fatigue for Marvel movies, for any kind of movies, exists. The question is whether or not it matters and to what degree it's there. As far as I'm concerned, there's probably been 11 or 12 times over the course of these 15 years that we've been doing this Marvel Cinematic Universe thing that various chunks of the audience or the whole audience has gotten burned out on the whole business but they keep releasing them they run on tv all the time and the general audience that doesn't spend all day of their lives like people in film media and hardcore film fans talking on social media about only one thing you know they reprocess the fatigue over a week or a weekend or something they get past it it's not really something they were thinking about to begin with and then they go back see a movie they enjoy and then they're back on board like there's no meeting what if people talk about things like fatigue like marvel fatigue superhero fatigue fantasy movie fatigue blockbuster fatigue sci-fi movie fatigue, romantic comedy fatigue at any point in time do you ever remember getting called to like a fucking meeting like like at your uh, like at your hoa or like brought down to the community center or like a town hall meeting or some shit and one of the things at the minutes was by the way how are we feeling about the marvel movies are we all still on board with Star Wars? I want to table this. No, that's not a thing that happens. Genre fatigue is a hypothetical bullshit academic thing that people in film schools and movie media and, and other shit that most of the world doesn't give a shit about have time to think about. And if it ever does truly happen, like when things do pass out of fashion for like, you know, five or ten whole years at a time, like westerns or disaster movies or whatnot, it's not something that you can see until you're ten or twelve years out from when it happened, and then they start coming back. And then you realize, oh, hey, you know, I think there might have been western fatigue for a while, and I know that because I notice now there are westerns and there weren't for a while. But you don't see it in the middle of it. How could you? Like, anyone who asks about, is there Marvel fatigue, what they're really asking, is, it's always a film critic, or a, a, a film person who wants to be a film critic, or someone who just isn't getting paid to do it, but still bitches about movies online all day. And what they're really asking is, can I please finally stop talking about this? The answer is usually, yes, please do, nobody wants to hear what you have to say anyway. 
But of course, they can't stop talking about it because everyone else is, and they'll be left out of the conversation. So what they're really asking is, will everyone else please talk about something that I want to talk about? Of course, if you had anything interesting to say, you could be directing that conversation, but you don't. But like, does it exist? Does even I, who loves a lot of these fucking movies every once in a while, say it's like, you know, even I'm getting a little sick of talking about this once in a while? Yeah. And it lasts about like, uh, you know, a day or a couple hours. And then I say, oh, hey, here's a new commercial for something. And then I'm back on board because I've got a million other things going on in my life. I don't have time. I'm fatigued enough by other things to not be fatigued about the fucking Marvel movies. What's going on with you that you can be? It kind of seems like you should have other things going on in your life, would be my thought there. <clears throat> but okay, hyperbole about the need for entertainment media to manufacture conflict narratives where they don't exist because all the real conflict narratives in the industry these days occur at the corporate level and are thus, uh, well, perhaps more difficult to cover since they involve everybody's bosses. <clears throat> well, if we're playing along and acting like there's something here, it's the question of whether or not simply the Marvel cycle but the whole shared universe, comic book, superhero, genre mashup, whatever we're calling it now, cycle has hit its peak as the centerpiece of blockbuster entertainment and is now on the predictable downward trend that, and if so, is this observable in the reception of the various phase for movies at the box office, which outside the ones where we're adjusting based on COVID, still having been an active impediment, have been putting up big but not Avengers big numbers, and good but not Avengers good audience response, apart from that one that was Avengers All Spider-Man's edition, and the streaming TV show releases, which now arrive at a regular pace and consistent caliber enough to have rapidly evolved from, there's a new Marvel show and it's the only thing pop culture will talk about for the next month and a half, to, oh, heh, another one of these. Girl Hulk now? Mummy Guy, maybe? That sounds nifty, I'll probably watch that. Until the by now reliable point, either at mid-season or the very last episode, where something really potentially huge maybe happens to set up other movies, characters, concepts, etc., that everyone has been hoping to see appear, return, or just get mentioned, which then leaks to social media and everyone loses their minds or has to run back and binge the whole thing right away, thus proving the entire premise of this whole discussion pointless, and also why they're just going to keep winning this game until the heat death of the actual goddamn universe. And meanwhile, the movie theater comeback story of 2022, which, heading in, the whole industry had basically resigned itself to accepting as being the final opportunity for Marvel and Disney to swagger in and cement their dominion over the next 15 to 20 years of cinematic culture by being the only box office force capable of showing a real resurgence after the pandemic instead became, holy shit, turns out people really wanted to see Top Gun Part 2, huh? Who knew? Which, I mean, I knew. I knew the whole damn time. Did anyone not know the whole damn time? I mean, look, I'm as glad as anyone to see both that and stuff like Everything Everywhere All at Once come out and crush it this year so we can at least get some spark of variety going again. That's a good thing, but I'm not sure why it's being treated like someone discovering a secret mystery formula when I could have told you Top Gun 2 would have been the biggest movie whatever year it came out immediately after Top Gun 1. Like, the only reason it took this long to get a Top Gun 2 is that back when Top Gun 1 came out, it wasn't necessarily the kind of movie you immediately did a sequel to, and Tom Cruise pivoted to dramas and trying to win awards, and after that, the Mission Impossible series became his big action franchise instead. Also, sidebar, can we stop pretending there's this big meaningful difference between the Mission Impossible movies and Marvel, DC, whatever superhero stuff? I mean, apart from the fact that I find most of that series to be kind of overrated installment to installment, you know, like, strip off the superficialities and genre pedigree. You know, the meaningful difference between the Mission Impossible movies and the Captain America movies is that in between the sequels, Ethan Hunt doesn't team up with, like, Gladiator, Robocop, and Sonic for one bigger movie. Like I said before, as far as I'm concerned, these culture fatigue questions are usually the wrong question, or at least asked in the wrong way, or based on the wrong data. And even if they're being asked in good faith, the answers that get the most attention are almost always going to be the ones that don't give you anything like a good faith or unbiased reading, but instead twist things up to serve the agenda of the person doing the answering. Ask someone who loves the Marvel Cinematic Universe to death, would happily watch nine more movies and a dozen more shows a year, and practically lives at Avengers Campus Disney, and they'll tell you not only no, never, but they'll have an excuse for every single shortcoming, so well-practiced Kamala Khan would tell him to rein it in a bit. She blasted through Thanos' fleet like a flaming angel, and you know what? She looked good doing it. I know, some of you think, well, she abandoned the people of Earth, but like, look, it's, it's not true. Obviously, we don't know exactly what she's been up to, but hey, maybe she just needed a break, you know? Can a woman just live? On the other hand, if you ask YouTube or adjacent social media loudmouths, Marvel Studios has been over since 2019 and is now only getting more over because there's an increasing number of loud women and uppity non-white peoples in the movies and as proof, you need only look at the numbers, which, okay, that's kind of dubious since now what we've got for the numbers in this case are box office numbers, half of which still have pandemic recovery and staggered and or not yet released in this or that large territory asterisk smeared all over them, or streaming stats, which are not independently tracked in a reliable fashion and only selectively available in a take-our-word 
word for it fashion from the actual studios, but okay. Black Widow, Shang-Chi, and Eternals all did about as well as things could do during the pandemic, and let's be honest here, getting any version of a movie about the fucking Eternals to 400 million global is about all the evidence anyone should need that a brand still works because nobody has ever cared about the Eternals. Spider-Man did great, Doctor Strange 2 did better than Doctor Strange, Thor 4 did about on par with Thor 3, which is still damn impressive for a part 4, and they moved it from November like part 3 to summer, so worst case read there is that the Thor franchise has a ceiling and it's more of a fall property. Next one is Black Panther 2 in November, which, wow, that's gonna be a whole other discussion, but also it has a big holiday box office rival in Avatar 2, in which case the discourse is gonna have to figure out how to talk about the epic showdown between Disney and also Disney. And yeah, as for the stuff that's streaming on Disney+, Plus, yeah, the ones with better known actors or established characters from the movies do better than the ones with new people that ran at the same time on the same service as Obi-Wan. That pretty much tracks. Now, like, I'm well aware that the people that most need to hear me on this part aren't going to hear me because I'm someone who, A, is a fan of the Marvel stuff for the most part going way back, and B, doesn't generally dislike most of the movies. I think most of them are fine, several are honestly really good to great, a couple of them are excellent, I mean, they've been the biggest thing in the world for like 15 years now for a reason, and I'm not gonna pretend that there's something conspiratorial going on with that to make myself look more artificially neutral on the matter, you don't have that kind of long-term success without putting out good product, it's just kind of how it works. <sighs> anyway, the point is, looking at all that, do I see a pattern that says there's a specific meaningful fatigue atmosphere setting in on the wider culture over this specific brand or set of properties beyond more conventional explanation of when you do the biggest global movie event of all time, like Avengers Endgame, and don't immediately retire and go home after, anything you do as a follow-up will be less impressive in one way or another, which is just kind of logical common sense? I mean, no. Not really, no, I, I, I don't. Now look, if we're talking about social media or YouTube content or press coverage trends, then yes, absolutely, the overarching trend line of default reaction to the general concept of the Marvel movies between Iron Man in 2008 and right now, 2022, has taken a complete 180. Like, as complete as a 180 can get in these cases, from this whole thing I love is taking over the world and I am thrilled, how can I help boosterism back when, all the way to now where it's more like this thing took over the world and it's an evil, woke, Illuminati, global homo dystopia, please join my crusade to liberate us from Mickey's tyranny. But that's not fatigue, that's changes in cultural positioning across the chronological passage of time. In the early 2000s, the big nerd culture blockbuster explosion that culminated in the birth of the MCU in the 2010s, the Disney buyout, and then the Avengers was for the whole generation of not only younger millennial audiences, but also elder millennial and Gen X writers and content creators in the entertainment press, largely viewed as kind of a pop culture insurgency. It had formal B-movie icons like Sam Raimi and Peter Jackson sweeping into A-list Hollywood and taking over with big lavish production based on fucking Lord of the Rings and Spider-Man comics, and however manufactured and overstated and extremely problematic that whole we're outsider rebels and we're taking over sentiment would turn out to be by the time it was still getting waved around on behalf of the Buffy guy doing the first Avengers movie, yeah, it was a thing in the air. But a decade is a long time, and even when it doesn't also include two of the most historic, ideologically divergent, and socially fraught presidential administrations, multiple military conflagrations, and a global viral plague across the breadth of it over that decade, gas and shock, people's ages, views, and social standings change a lot more than the continuum of a fictional universe of movies everyone still regularly goes to see that whole time. That, that fight was so many years ago, I'm a completely different person now. Literally. Huh. Meaning here specifically that the optimistic, nerdy, booster, insurgent, rebellion, new media voices at the start of the Marvel Age are now very much representative of the mainstream established media overview of popular culture. So of course the only version of an edgy contrarian position that can exist profitably is performing negativity in the other direction. Duh. Lisa, what are you rebelling against? What do you got? <laughs> Are there other factors? Sure, but I'd hazard that that's the main one, and it's not really a puzzle to figure out. Fifteen years ago, the MCU was, to a degree any big expensive Hollywood movie thing can be, the weird, new, different, nerdy outsider thing, and now it's literally the Disney Channel. It's McDonald's, the suburbs, soccer moms, and hybrid SUVs. I mean, shit, my mom knows that there are two people called Hawkeye and has differing but positive opinions about each of them. In that context, sections of the pop commentariat either tuning out or turning aggressively against the most mainstream thing in the mainstream isn't evidence of cultural fatigue, but evidence of cultural entrenchment. It is my honor to introduce, for the first time in Avengers Campus, Captain America. Avengers K. 
campus.